Let me thank uh, Duskai and his collective and to Pomoshe for a very kind introduction. I am a Holocaust historian, very classic as they come, who works on Jewish history of the Holocaust and have moved towards working on history of sexuality. And in the last four or five years, I've come drawn to queer history, which led me to ask, how can we, in a meaningful way, queer Holocaust history? What do I mean with it? I look at Holocaust victims who were persecuted for being Jewish, who engaged either consensually or for romantic reasons, or for somewhat more pragmatic reasons in same-sex activity, and how they are depicted in memory and other people's testimonies. The conclusion is very quickly told and is quite tragic. Hardly any one of them bore testimony. They are depicted in third-person testimonies by other straight survivors as monsters with brutal homophobia. The impact was clear. Almost none of them was allowed to bear testimony. Which also leads to the issue that the history of the Holocaust is a total lacuna. Some people touch on it on passing. Kim Winchman, in her beautiful book Before Auschwitz, talks about uh, people who are persecuted according to paragraph 175 and are Jewish. Uh, Beate Meyer wrote a beautiful paper about a lesbian couple of a Jewish non Jewish woman uh, in wartime in Hamburg. Um, but really head on the topic has not been focused, which is also directed to the issue, you're coming to save me, thank you, um, that um, yes, you may be thinking, what about all the research about the persecution of gay men, the paragraph 175 in Germany, paragraph 129 in Austria, but that is a cousin to my work, because these people look at gay and lesbians uh, who were persecuted because of their sexual, uh, 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 sexual orientation. I look at Jews who are deported as Jews and what happens with them in the camps and how then the community, especially in the monosexual camps, comes to terms with observing same-sex desire. One issue when you think about it is that these two fields are so separate. It is as if queer history behaves that all the gay and lesbian victims who were deported were non-Jewish, and as if all the Jews who were deported for being Jews were straight. And the story is much more complicated. There is much to be said in terms of background on homophobia. I want to very briefly uh, introduce a scholarship of people like uh, Insa Eschebach and Ulrike Jans, who very bravely address the issue of homophobia of the prisoner society. Um, I will give you just in a bit a small example. It's, it's still not working. Um, and they showed that the homophobia in the camps um, was neither a direct continuation of the pre-war. It was also not a reaction to the paragraph 175 of the Nazis. It was also not a continuation of the metaphor of the gay Nazi about uh, whom many people have worked. But uh, in the Eschebach showed, and her um, analysis is the most persuasive to date, that it's a form of what anthropologists call othering. Uh, people keep obsessing about same-sex desire in their neighborhood, and it's always the other. If it's narrated by a German political prisoner, there are Poles. If it's narrated by a Pole, it's the Sinti and Roma, it's the social, and so on. It's a very profound tool of othering. How does this homophobia look like? And let me give it to you on an example of Marta Mosse, whose picture I would love to share with you now, if it were working. Um, because um, I was struck that so far Marta Mosse didn't come up. She was this uh, uh, a cousin or um, a distant aunt of George Mosse. And uh, she was a really important and amazing uh, woman in her own right. She rose to the ranks in Prussian police, then after 33, became a towering figure in the Reichsvereinigung, in the Reich Association of German Jews, was deported to Theresienstadt, and her family, ah, my God, excellent. Here you see Marta Mosse when she speaks uh, at the Wilhelmstrasse trial in 48. Um, and uh, she had at home a gentile partner, Anna Stock, uh, Javier, who is here, wrote very movingly about her, and I urge you all to read Javier's wonderful article in German Studies Review. Um, but people have really not addressed Marta Mosse's uh, queer intersection as a Holocaust victim. We know about her work in Theresienstadt. We know that after the war, her uh, post-war essay was particularly difficult uh, because she was a queer woman um, and she was accused of being a Jewish collaborator, but she's the only one of the Reichsvereinigung who is singled out of that. All other her male straight colleagues are not. Um, 
when I was uh, editing a memoir of Zuzane Falov, a young Jewish woman from Ostrava that she wrote after the war living in uh, Tel Aviv in German, I came across a following quote that is quite classic for the many, many homophobic testimonies, uh, because in November 43 uh, she works in checking on the elderly people um, and comes uh, to check uh, on the Magdeburg Barak. And let me quote. At this occasion, I am also to announce the return of a patient, an old prominent lady who has a room of her own in the Magdeburg Barak. That was the seat of the Jewish self-administration. I have to knock at the door for a long time. I hear aroused whispering, and when the door is opened, I see a tousled bed, two women with morning gowns hastily thrown over, visibly embarrassed and titillated. A terrible disgust comes over me. I never knew that such a thing is possible even here. End of quote. Now, we will not know if this is Marta Mosse. There were some 50 other older prominent ladies, but of course she comes to mind. But even with this not knowing, this is something that is so systematic for the erasure of queer desire. Even the picture that I'm finally able to share with you is evocative of, uh, the, of this expensive, uh, extensive erasure. Um, uh, Sky, you have told us uh, how in Schenkendorf, uh, Hilda Mosse's uh, bell has been smelted, so it's kind of one of the moments. Uh, so for Marta Mosse, we have some beautiful pictures of her, but they are all under Getty and they're incredibly expensive to share. So basically the only picture, if you want to have of Marta Mosse, is this kind of picture that is not about her, is about Wilhelm Strasse, it doesn't show her very well. So it's one of the many moments when kind of queer women are erased. Queer history is far too often basically gay men talking about gay men, and I think we really need to counter it, it is a little bit more complicated. You may be thinking, as I talk about the erasure of the gay testimonies, with what archives am I working? I will show you a little bit on the two examples I will be discussing, how I do it in practice. It basically means an archaeological approach and kind of taking it from one step to another. One more point is why do I call it gay uh, queer history? Why don't I speak about gay and lesbians? This is a bit the kind of political approach um, of queer uh, studies 10 or 20 years ago. But the really important thing here is also the issue of umbrella and inclusivity. Um, as Regina Kunzl and others have shown, gay and lesbian uh, indict uh, a define um, an, an identification. We must know that these people actually identified as gay and lesbian. But many of the people I write about engage in same-sex activity in the camps, but never uh, define as gay and lesbian. Maybe they are closeted. Maybe they are not. It is much more inclusive and also goes really importantly against the binarity that either you are straight or you are heterosexual, because of course things are not so easy. Those of you who know um, about history of concentration camps and prisoner society will be aware that many of the queer relationships in the camps were quite exploitative and could be violent. However, this does not only apply for queer relationships, this applies for all relationships in the Holocaust. They were often quite exploitative and violent, and you, Regina, have just talked about it. You have focused mostly on the perpetrators, but when you then move to the prisoner society in camps and ghettos, uh, the conditions of sex work are often quite violent. Because I'm aware that for many of you, this is kind of your first taster of the issue, I decided also for political reasons to focus on two, uh, two stories that are consensual and where we can talk about love. Um, I also think that this conference needs more queerness and therefore it's good to start on a positive note. My first case study is Jiří Vrba, who was born in 1924. And I came across him last summer quite by accident reading a testimony of his friend, who just in passing said something like, my friend, the homosexual Jiří Vrba. And then I started looking into him, and no one was more surprised than I, because it turned out that Vrba was one of the founding figures of the Czechoslovak uh, Association of the Survivors. Um, now, this is the surrounding in which I grew up. My grandparents were connected to them, I know many of them, and yet I never heard his name. It's not enough of an explanation to say that he died in the early 90s. Many of those people are still remembered. And it turned out by a fortunate accident, and thanks to help of my friends at the Prague Jewish Museum, that all his papers are still at the Prague Jewish Museum. And then they sent it to me over, and immediately I started looking into them. And the only mention of romantic or whatever love is a testimony of his uh, girlfriend from Theresienstadt, Eva Kominikova, who kind of works his lyrical about how they were together. And I do want to share a following quote from uh, Kominikova's uh, recollection. I don't want to get into two personal memories, but I have to say that I loved Jirka very, very much. 
that we always got together, only to break up again, that my first love was beautiful and bitter, but one forgets the ugly things. Irka was very well brought up, he courted me, he brought me many flowers, small gifts. For instance, he made me a pretty small bracelet, which he gave me in Terezin chat for my birthday, which I kept to this day, end of quote. And you know, Sky, when two days ago you kind of brought up the issue of uh, Mosse in his medicine apartment having those Renaissance chairs and um, what was it, and Medici tapestries, I thought you can also read it differently. It's not only about Bildung and being of wealthy background habitus, it is also about queerness. When you think about the apartments of certain class of uh, wealthy gay men, this is kind of something that you have it. You would not necessarily read it when you read this quote with um, straight eyes, but when you read it against uh, gegen den Strich with kind of this queer subversivity, when you see him being polite, doing the gestures, going to theater, bringing the bracelets, you definitely see the queer issues. In fall 44, Verba was at 20 years, like many other people from Theresienstadt, deported to Auschwitz. And I was able to ascertain from an interview with his later partner that it was in Auschwitz uh, that he found for first time he had a queer experience because his fellow bunk bed uh, inmate, a Frenchman, he and him uh, became intimate with each other and he experienced it very much as a loving romantic moment. Now the Frenchman did not speak any foreign language like French people sometimes do and Verba did not speak uh, any French. However, they somehow were able to communicate and eventually when they were separated and Verba was sent uh, to forced a labor to Buchenwald, the Frenchman told him, if you survive, look for me in Paris in Rue Vagram. And Verba always remembered it. He indeed survived Buchenwald. And after the war, when he recovered a little bit, made his way to what is, as I found out, Avenue de Vacram. It's one of the... No, this is me. <laughs> Why she ask for too much? <laughs> Uh, and um, if, you, if you know Paris a little bit, you know that Avenue uh, de Vagram is one of these really big boulevards that goes at least three kilometers long. Uh, but because I knew this conference is coming up and because I knew that Moshe at his heart is a French history and I thought he will be happy to see me uh, kind of visiting Avenue de Vagram and looking for the old traces uh, of uh, Verba. Well, you will be not surprised when I say Verba did not find his lover. But when he returned to Prague, because he didn't want to stay, he still had some relatives in uh, Czechoslovakia, he came out as a self-aware gay man, and he never hid that. Uh, he was able to find a partner in the 1960s, he worked as a director in theater, and also, as I found out, for basically something like 40 years, he cooperated with Czechoslovak secret police writing reports on um, uh, immigrants in the West. Um, last fall, I was able to find his partner, um, Miroslav Spotetel, who was a, quite a bit younger. Today, he's himself an old man. And he told me about their relationship, how they were out to both of their families, um, how they lived together, um, and how in 1993, just before Christmas, Verba had a heart attack. When Spotetel visited him in the hospital, Verba tried to hold his hand, and Spotetel was so painfully aware of the good opinions of the medical personnel that he would push his hand away because he was afraid of being outed. And yet his partner was dying, and he knew it, and he just didn't care anymore. And this old guy kind of was sitting there telling me, he tried to hold my hand, and I pushed it away, and then he died, and this all that stays behind it. I'm really sitting there last November with this old guy who will probably die soon, who is the chain smoker, who never had a partner since 1993, and they were sharing these stories with me. I thought how incredibly desolate. And I think this raises the big issues, and RC, you really beautifully raised it yesterday, about how we make sense of these stories. It is incredibly touching, but it also kind of raises the bigger questions of about the heteronormativity in which we live and how different these lives could be. So to make a little bit more a uh, positive example, I want to move to Margot, uh, who was born in 1928, who is still alive, and who I was able to uh, find through public history because I thought this is quite a difficult topic. It's important that I'm out there and decided from the beginning on to give lectures to public audiences, to also write for mass media. And very important for me was knowing Moshe because I was able to find Margot through Moshe's help. He introduced me to her distant niece. Uh, Margot was raised in Germany and when she was 14 years of age, uh, was deported with her family from Bielefeld to Theresienstadt. Like many other youngsters in Theresienstadt, she was placed in a youth home and met here a Viennese girl called Ditta, who she described as the love of her life. 
What is really interesting, and if you know the stories about children in Theresienstadt, they are often told quite heteronormatively. And yet Margot recalled that at night when the girls would go uh, to bed, all girls were couples with each other and then would go to bunk beds and be intimate with each other, and yet during the day nobody would speak about it. The special thing about Margot is that she's the only one who identified eventually as a lesbian and eventually had her coming out. In spring 44, both girls and their families were deported to Auschwitz, and here comes an important push, because eventually when the selection comes, Margot's family decides that they are too old and they will not try to make it, and they decide to stay, and they know that it will mean for them a gas chamber. But Ditta passes the selection, and at this moment, Margot decides this is for her not about living or dying, but she will go anywhere with her partner. And she went to her parents and said, I want to live, I will go with Ditta. And they don't understand. It's the moment when her father starts crying, and she chooses a new kinship. She chooses kinship that is not biological, but queer, which is another really important thing about queer history. History of the Holocaust that helps us recognize kinship beyond the always same biological heteronormative patterns. Both girls then survive forced labor in Hamburg, in Neuengamme, and are liberated eventually in spring 45 in bergen Belsen, and they are separated. Um, Margot lived in Sweden, eventually moved to the US, um, lived in East Village with a lesbian partner who later moved to be a, a proofreader uh, for a New Yorker, Lou Burke, who is actually quite well known in the New Yorker circles. And in the mid 50s decided she actually wants to have family and the only way for her, how it was imaginal to have children, was to marry a man. So she married, lived a halfway happy marriage, not that happy. Eventually they divorced, she had women partners again. And when she was 88, um, she relocated from New York to Arizona, to actually south of Tucson, because uh, New York was too cold for her. And then she came out to her family, and they had this wonderful, wonderful reaction. They said, Mom, what else is new? They knew all along. And yet, it is only with me when I interviewed her that she came out and shared these and many other really, really interesting stories about what does it mean to be a lesbian woman uh, in the camps, about queer desire, about kinship, about homophobia of the other prisoners, even though, like many other Holocaust survivors living in North America, she has been interviewed many, many times. Here we go. Um, it is because I give her a framework, because I myself am a lesbian woman, she knows it about, we, uh, about me, we spent a couple of days together, and I enabled her to give a framework for a testimony that she actually always wanted to say. I saw it just this uh, last month, when she was again interviewed at the Neuengamme Memorial, and she was interviewed by someone else, and then she starts censoring herself again. And it's also kind of important to listen to what people are willing to talk about. Working on queer history of the Holocaust means also analyzing homophobia in the prisoner society. And that's not easy, it's kind of pretty difficult because we like to think about Holocaust survivors as nice people. And yet this is so violent and full of prejudice and um, othering and marginalization. Writing on these difficult topics also means that I myself quite often become subject of personal attacks. I will not lie to you, it is painful. But it's also interesting because once it stops hurting so much, it's something that it becomes a source I can include in my work. If you want, we can talk about it in Q&A. So let me come to a conclusion. There's like two, three points I want to make. In my opinion, some of the most exciting current Holocaust scholarship is on testifying work by wonderful people like Alexander Garbarine, Lisa Leff, and so on is about like how people who survive mass atrocity or genocide, the urge to bear testimony to write uh, a chronicle of what happened. But it's not everybody who is allowed to bear testimony, because in our culture, the narrator always must be virtuous or to repent to be virtuous. And somebody who is marked away the society as a deviant is a priori sinful and therefore is not allowed to tell his or her story. And this is why I would like to int introduce the concept of historical citizenship. So in order to be kind of part of history, to be a historical citizen, you need to have three or four things. One is to have a voice, that is to be able to bear testimony. Second, to have a name. So when you think about the Jeskobücher or about the Gedenkbücher that have been published in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia, and so on, this is where it comes down, or to have a grave which, of course, the Holocaust victims will not have a grave, but that brings us again to the memorial books. This is why it is so important to tell one's story. Otherwise, it is as if one did not exist. 
uh, the queer victims are usually excluded from the stories. They are told nameless. They are just like there was this horrible neighbor at my bunk bed who was a horrible lesbian and I was always afraid of her. This is also kind of what links us with the testifying to the important Jewish tradition of Zachor, remember. It were the power structures within the survivor community that had a direct impact on what could be narrated. They also created the Holocaust archive and the history that we know today, dictating how we understand who we are, what is proper and what is not. It also created our non-existent knowledge of people who once lived. People without history are dust. Finally, what is the bigger sense of queering history of the queer history of the Holocaust? Like, why this also? It's not fan relief, and I very much believe there is actually quite an existential point beyond just historical citizenship. Because it enables us to question and deconstruct the normal. This is the really main thing of queer theory, that it allows us to recognize how normative we are and question these things. Holocaust, when you think about it, is this has become really this very, very normative mass narrative about what is correct and what is wrong. And we have been fighting over the last 20 years to include some other victims, the sentient trauma, the so-called habitual criminals, the social victims. When we say more ambivalent and complex stories about victims, it does not mean that we are evil people. We just make them more humane. And that's so, so important. So with queering the hol uh, Holocaust history, what I'm really trying to do is to fight for a more open, more inclusive and less judgmental history. Thank you so much. <laughs>